Today, I'm going to see if I can beat Pokemon Ultra Sun with hardcore Nuzlocke rules using only fire types. Pokemon Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon are known as some of the hardest games to Nuzlocke. And fire types, while overall strong, kind of have a lot of weaknesses and generally lack utility. So a full team of fire types will definitely be interesting. You can pause here if you're interested in seeing the rules. And before we kick it off, let's quickly look at our encounters. Wow, we got a star studded cast for this run, huh? This is going to be fun. Our run kicks off in the island region of Alola, and almost immediately we get to choose our starter. Of course, we go with the fire type, Litten, and we take this opportunity to hoist him like Simba. After one quick look at my eyes, this Litten knows, I mean business. And it was in this moment that he whispered something to me. He said, make sure to let people know if they enjoy the video, they should like the video and subscribe to the channel. Wow, thanks Litten, you do my job for me. Soon after choosing Litten, we meet our rival, Hal. And it's at this point that I learn this is not meant to be a normal Pokemon game. This is Game Freak's cinematic masterpiece. My God, are there a lot of cutscenes in this game, and I will be skipping pretty much all of them in this video. After slogging through the story, we're presented with our first real challenge, when we go back to school. And no, I am not talking about Long Division. This teacher fight right at the end of the trainer school killed seven of our runs single-handedly. I know you're wondering, how did it do this? Well, at this point in the game, we only have Litten, and she carries a Poplio, which is super effective against us. And only having one Pokemon against a super effective Pokemon really just makes the fight come down to RNG, so that's why I killed so many runs. I'm good at Nuzlocke, okay? I promise. One really important thing we learned at trainer school is how to pet a Tauros, which allows us to progress to the next area, Howley City. And it's here that we meet my all-time favorite evil team and fall-style inspiration, Team Skull. I wish I had more jokes about these guys, but they're just so hilarious on their own, I don't think I need to do much here. Anyway, they start popping and locking at us in the street, and we know it's time to battle. We take them out, and then we're challenged by the first trial captain. Now this isn't the actual trial, this is just a little pre-trial, but this is an interesting fight because her Smeargle always carries a super effective move against your starter. And at this point, we still only have Litten on the team. So this is another RNG fest to make sure that we can get past it. On the first turn, we trade attack with a Fire Fang against the Young Goose, and then we take it out with a second Fire Fang on the second turn. From here, it's just the Smeargle left, but this thing does carry Technician as its ability, which makes its weaker moves actually more powerful. So it'll have a boosted Water Gun if it chooses to use it, which it does. Thankfully, it doesn't do too much damage, and we take it out with a Fire Fang on the next turn since we outspeed. With the early game RNG out of the way, we move on to Route 2 and the Howley Cemetery, where we can use Island Scan to get our first encounter, a Litwick. We nickname this thing Fuego, and then check its nature and see that it has a careful nature, which we're really disappointed about because it decreases its special attack, which is supposed to be its best stat. Not the end of the world, but annoying. Still, the ghost type is very useful, especially in early game encounters where a lot of Pokemon just carry normal moves. From here, we work our way around to the northern part of Route 2 where we get our next encounter, a Growlithe, which we catch and nickname Hot Dog. And we check its nature and it's a jolly nature, which is pretty useful. Unfortunately, it doesn't have Intimidate, which would be really useful for the next two big fights, but we can always change it with Ability Capsule later. After expanding our team, it's time to head into the first island challenge, which pits us against this backflipping weasel. We start the fight off with Growlithe and start hitting it with Embers to fish for burns. Unfortunately, our Ember doesn't burn, and also it hits us with a scary face to get speed control and calls an ally, then smacks us in the face with a tackle. Thankfully, its ally, Young Goose, goes for an Odor Sleuth, which spares us some damage, the next turn, the totem hits us with a tackle, which takes us down into our berry range, thankfully. And then the ally hits us with another tackle, which takes us pretty low. Thankfully, our ember burns and also gets a crit, which takes this thing super low, and we're able to switch in Litten and finish it off. The next turn, we clean up the ally with a double kick, and that's the first totem. From here, we head up to Route 3, where we're able to use Island Scan to grab a Charmander. And then it's finally time for the first Kahuna fight. Hala specializes in fighting types and has three Pokemon. Two of these Pokemon can't actually hit Litwick, but his ace, Crabrawler, has Pursuit, which is super effective against Litwick and could kill it in one hit. Naturally, we lead with Litwick because the Machop can't actually hit it, and we use a Will-O-Wisp on the first turn. It goes for Focus Energy, which makes it more likely to get a crit if it stays in, which it usually doesn't. Usually, Hollow will switch to his ace, Crabrawler, because he sees the super effective Pursuit. So we switch to Charmeleon thinking this is gonna happen, but unfortunately, he uses a full heal to heal the burn. So we hit the Machop with Dragon Rage. It almost kills, but not quite. And then the Machop does big damage to us. The next turn, the Machop is low enough to get taken out, but we're pretty low on Charmeleon. He sends in his Makuhita, so we send in Litwick because Makuhita can't hit us. The next turn, we read a switch, so we use Will-O-Wisp, which actually happens, and we end up burning the Cabrawler. At this point, its damage is halved from the burn, but Pursuit is still really scary. 
and it gets scarier and scarier every turn. We bite the bullet and make an early switch and take the double damage pursuit. Litwick lives and we're able to bring in Growlithe. The next turn, it uses its Z move all out pummeling. This thing could crit and kill us right now. Luckily it doesn't, but it does proc our berry and leave us pretty low on HP. So we switch in Litten to be safe. The next turn, Cabral uses Leer, so we get a free switch, but our defense is lowered. We still go for a bite and get a lucky flinch and the burn damage is enough to finish it off. Next he sends in his Makuhita. So we bring in Litwick and this thing can't actually touch Litwick. It can, however, lower our accuracy and be really annoying, but we won't show that. First Kahuna down, and the experience from the battle was enough to evolve Litten into a Tauru Cat. After beating the Kahuna, we get the Pokey Ride, which is my personal favorite thing about this game. Replacing HMs with such a fun mechanic was an awesome idea. Only one thing beats rolling up to the Pokemon Center on the back of your Tauros, and you'll find out what that is later in the video. On our way off of Melee Melee Island, we pick up the Fly MZ, and this golfer lady teaches us a new mating call. Then we're introduced to Island Oak, who obviously doesn't understand the risks of skin cancer. We complete the fifth out of 15 tutorials in this game, which is the tutorial for Mantine Surf. Woo! Next it's onto Akala Island and Howe is very excited. We have an anticlimactic battle with him, then head over to the Pokemon daycare and get an egg that contains an Eevee. We hatch it, then head back to the daycare and grab a Firestone to immediately evolve it into a Flareon. Now the next trial is the Water Trial, which is very scary for us, so having an evolved Pokemon this early like Flareon is going to be super crucial to beating that. But before we get into the challenge, we have to be introduced to our favorite emo kid from middle school, Gladion. He has something to do with Team Skull or something, but I don't know, we just battle him. He leads with a Zubat, at least I think it's a Zubat. What? Wait, what? We take out the Zorora, and then we take out the real Zubat and his ace type null comes in, which I'll be honest, I did not know was a Pokemon until playing this game. A few fire fangs is enough to take it out. We're not really worried about taking damage from this thing because Flareon is super tanky, which bodes well for the water challenge, I guess. We head into the water challenge and get a new Pokey ride, and then we challenge the totem. This totem is an Araquanid, and not only does this fight take place in rain, which weakens our fire moves and strengthens its water moves, but also Araquanid has the water bubble ability, which prevents it from being burned and also makes it extra resist fire type moves. Luckily, we have a plan. We are going to beat it with the power of dance. No, actually, Flareon can learn Last Resort from the Move Tutor on the first island beach, which turns into a 200 power Z move that you can use at any time with Normalium Z. So we hit it with the old Breakneck Blitz, which doesn't quite kill, but luckily its only attack is Bubble, which has a low base power. It does, however, call in its ally, Masquerain, and we take an Intimidate. We use a Bite, which isn't quite enough to finish it off, and unfortunately, the Masquerain uses Tailwind, which means it's going to outspeed us, so we can't just finish it off next turn. So we swap into Charmeleon, who takes the damage okay. And then at this point, we realize that we're going to need to swap around through our team until this Tailwind runs out. So we bring in Litwick. Litwick takes enough damage that if the Masquerain used an attack move, it would actually finish it off. Luckily, it uses Stun Spore instead. So the Litwick lives, and we swap in Growlithe. Unfortunately, the Masquerain uses Bug Bite, which eats our berry and leaves the Growlithe really low. At least that was the last turn of the Tailwind, but unfortunately we don't have another good switch, so we have to stay in and risk it and go for Flame Wheel, which fortunately ends up KOing the Araquanid with a critical, which might've actually mattered. And the Masquerain actually spares us by going for a Stun Spore. All that's left to do is clean up this Masquerain, so we swap in Torracat. And it eats our berry again. This guy is starving. Luckily, a couple Fire Fangs are enough to take it out. And the Water Challenge is down. This for sure could have been a run ender, so I'm glad to come out of here with no Pokemon lost. Next up, the aliens challenge us to a battle. We meet this tiny person with this huge horse. We get to do yet another tutorial with this Lucha Wrestler, and we get our next catch, Magby. From here, we head up to the top of Wayla Volcano, and it's time for the fire challenge, which introduces us to our favorite character in the game, this guy. Wow, just look at him go. Anyway, we clear through the quiz, and then we're challenged by Totem Marowak. This fight shouldn't be too bad because we do resist all Marowak's moves, but we have done a few battles consecutively before this, so we're not at full health. Before this, we managed to get an ability capsule and switch Growlithe's ability over to Intimidate, which should be great for decreasing the damage that this Marowak does. We also taught our Growlithe Thief to steal the Thick Club from the Marowak and greatly decrease its damage output. Unfortunately, it detects the first turn, so we aren't able to hit it with Thief. Then the next turn, it calls in its ally Salazzle, and we accidentally misclick and use Thief on Salazzle instead. Salazzle uses Torment, so we can't use Thief again, and now we're in a more difficult situation than it really should have been. 
We're really worried about losing Growlithe to two attacks from the enemies, so we swap in Charmeleon. Luckily, Marowak uses Detect, so we're able to stand an extra turn with Charmeleon and get a Dragon Rage off on the Marowak. Thinking that the AI will see a kill on Charmeleon, I swapped Flareon, but they both use non-damaging moves. Pretty good for the swap, but weird. For sure weird. The next turn, we're miraculously able to tank a Venoshock from Salazzle and a Hex from Marowak, even though these moves are powered up because we're poisoned. We use a Bite, but it's not quite enough to finish it off, so we have to swap in Torracat, who comes in and tanks a couple hits and then finishes off the Marowak with a Bite. From here, we get into such a tough spot trying to take out the Salazzle that we have to bring in our Magby. Good thing this little guy is an absolute tank, and he takes the Venoshock like a champ and finishes it off with a faint attack. Three down, I don't know how many more to go. Next, we move on to Route 8, where we get our next catch, a Combuskin. Its firefighting dual type is great for resisting rock, and will be huge for the Island Kahuna, which is a rock type specialist. From here, we move on to the Lush Jungle, where we take on the next challenge, making soup. Oh, oh god, this totem is terrifying. Good thing we picked up Fire MZ from the last totem fight. This is gonna be quick. Like you may have guessed, the Lorantis goes down in one hit. With all three challenges done, we move through the cutscene forest and through the Diglett Tunnel and then into Coney Coney City, where we grab an Eviolite, which will be crucial for Combuskin and the Kahuna fight coming up. We also grab a Firestone from the Diglett Tunnel and use it to evolve Growlithe into an Arcanine. Next up is the Kahuna. Wait, Plumeria, come on. You are annoying, but I do like your style. After a quick battle with her, we move on to the Kahuna fight. Her whole team has maxed out attack EVs and hits our whole team for super effective damage other than Combuskin. This is the most dangerous fight yet. Our strategy here revolves around using Arcanine's Intimidate and Flareon's Baby Doll Eyes, which is a priority move that lowers attack, to lower the attack of the Anorith so that we can bring in the Combuskin to set up some workups and a Flame Charge to outspeed the rest of the team and sweep. Unfortunately, Flareon gets hit by a critical smackdown from Anorith and gets taken out. Rip, buddy. First death of the run. We bring Arcanine back in to get another Intimidate off, then we bring in Combuskin and set up three workups and two Flame Charges. Now we outspeed the rest of the team and should be able to one-shot everything. The second Flame Charge does take out the Anorith and then the Lilip comes in. This Lilip does have Brine which is a water type move that hits for double damage when you're below half health. So it's critical that we take this out in one hit, which we do with a Brick Break. Finally the Lycanroc comes in and we outspeed it and take it out with a Brick Break. And with that, one of the scariest fights of the whole run is done. And we're pretty much done with Akala Island at this point. But before we go, we stop off at Island Oak. And since we've collected so many totem stickers, he gives us a totem-sized Alolan Marowak. And from here, we move on to the Aether Paradise, which I'm really not sure what exactly it is, but if it's good enough for Pseudo Wudo, it's good enough for me. Here we meet this lady Lusamine, who does stuff. And we have a quick run-in with this interdimensional bucket hat wearing jellyfish. One battle and 45 minutes of cutscenes later, we're able to move on with our lives and move to the third island, Ula Ula Island. When thinking about this part in the game, I realized that after the second Kahuna, everything spikes in difficulty in this game. No trainers are free, and every encounter is dangerous. Also, how it's Land Ho, okay? The first thing that happens on this island is that Hao challenges us to a battle. His team still isn't really strong enough to challenge us at this point, so I won't really cover it too deeply. He does have a Vaporeon now, but it wasn't too much of a threat, so we dispatched him pretty quickly. And with the level cap increased, we're able to evolve our Torracat into an Incineroar. And I am really not sure what happened to Torracat between level 33 and 34, but it couldn't have been good. We progress the story a little bit, and then we're able to pop down to Route 11, where we use Island Scan to find him on Inferno, which we nicknamed Takis. This is a little bit better firefighting type than Blaziken, because it's slightly faster, and adding more rock resistance can never hurt. At this point, we head over to Route 10 and board the bus and prepare for our next totem challenge, which has us doing a lot of random chores, but primarily just wrangling these little pesky charge bugs that have gotten out. What are you doing out here, you little battery bug? With all the bugs accounted for, it's time for us to challenge the totem, this Toga Tomorrow, which jumps into this laser beam and gets totally juiced. Now our team might hit this super effectively because of its steel type, but it does have a plus two defense boost and Toga Tomorrow kind of hits like a truck. So it might not be a walk in the park. We lead with Arcanine to get the Intimidate off, which decreases Toga Tomorrow's main offensive stat. It makes it hit slightly less hard. After the first turn, it calls in its ally, Dedene, and we just start smacking both of them with super effective bulldozes. Unfortunately, due to its high defense and also its plus two defense boost, it doesn't do a ton of damage, but we take out the Dedene, and then the Toga Tomorrow calls in a Skarmory. At this point, I'm getting fed up with how little damage the Bulldoze is doing, so I bring in the Charmeleon to hit it with a special fire attack. And one Flame Burst from Charmeleon is more than enough to take this thing out. 
From here, we clean up the Skarmory with a Flame Burst, and we're done! Charmeleon did such a good job there, we let him evolve into a Charizard. And also, our Combuskin evolved into a Blaziken. Then we head back to the city, and this guy, Guzma, is getting all up in the professor's face. So, we have to teach him a lesson. Guzma does specialize in Bug-type Pokemon, which typically are weak to fire, but his lead, Galissapod, has a Water type and it hits super hard, so we have to be really careful here. The first turn we lead with Charizard and we set up a sunny day, mainly just to decrease the power of his water attacks. He hits us with a razor shell, which probably would have killed if we didn't set up that sun. From here, we have a hard choice to make. We can stay in and try to hit it with another move and try to get it below half health, which will make it switch out with its emergency exit ability, but that does risk losing Charizard if we can't get it below half health. We didn't really have another good switch and we do have the sun up, so flame burst does more damage, so we hit it with a flame burst. That triggers the switch, and the Masquerain comes in. Now, Masquerain is no joke either. This thing hits super hard. Thankfully, we're able to live in Air Slash and hit it with a Flame Burst and take it out in one hit. Then he brings his Galissapod back in, and we finish it off with a Flame Burst. Next, we head over to Route 12, and we pick up a new ride. And we get another encounter, a Torkoal, with Drought. Now, Drought is an ability that sets Sun up when the Pokemon enters the battlefield. And Sun decreases the power of water and increases the power of fire. So this thing effectively resists water and boosts our fire attacks. This thing is gonna be a huge addition to the team. Next, we head over to Blush Mountain where we get another encounter, a Turtonator. This thing is fire dragon type, which makes it resist water as well. Two defensive monsters added to the team back to back. We just got a lot stronger. Next, we head into this trailer park where we see this small child. No, oh no, it's just a squatting team skull member, huh? Anyway, on Route 15, as we're heading to the next challenge, we get ambushed by this fisherman, who has a Gyarados, who has max EVs. And we had our Magmar in, and we thought a Thunder Punch would kill because it's four times effective, but it didn't, and we lost Magmar to an Aqua Tail. It did crit, but I'm not sure if it mattered. I'll always remember you, Magmar. After this battle, we're able to evolve Monferno into an Infernape. Then we head into the spooky grocery store, where we play a little bit of Silent Hill. Spooky, wow. Closets in Alola sure are pretty nice. Huh. Oh, ah! This little spooky thing that ambushes us actually turns out to be the totem. Though we do resist all the fairy attacks from Mimikyu, it does have an Omni boost, and its disguise ability makes it so it takes no damage from the first attack that hits it. So this thing could give us a little bit of trouble. We leap with Arcanine and hit it with an Intimidate to lower its attack off rip. Then we take a Shadow Claw and we break its disguise with Aerial Ace. At the end of its turn, it calls in an ally, which is a Bonnet. So we swap in Torkoal to set up Sun and resist the physical attacks of Bidette. Unfortunately, the Bidette uses Screech, which harshly lowers our defense and makes Torkoal really susceptible to getting hit by big damage next turn. We want to stay in and get our Steelium Z move off, which will hit the Mimikyu for super effective damage. So we have to take a Shadow Claw and a Faint Attack from the Bidette, which leaves us pretty low, but we do get the Z move off. Unfortunately, it does not do nearly as much damage as we thought it would. So we swap out the Torkoal and bring in our Arcanine to hit and intimidate on both the Bidette and the Mimikyu. They hit us with two attacks, which leaves us around half health, so we do swap in Incineroar, just to be safe. We're a little spooked because we did just lose Magmar right before coming into this supermarket. The Incineroar doesn't take too much damage on the switch, so we're able to get a Darkest Lariat off, which just barely doesn't take out the Mimikyu. And unfortunately, Bennett uses Curse, which takes half its health, to take away a quarter of our health each turn. We can get rid of this by swapping, so we do. And we bring in Charizard to take out the Mimikyu with the Flame Burst. It does take a little bit of damage on the switch, but nothing too serious. And the next turn, we finish the Bonnet off with a Flame Burst. Another totem down. Next, we head down to the beach where we get a jet ski. Then we head into Ula Ula Meadow where we get our next encounter, an Oracorio. Fire flying types are always useful to have, especially because of the ground immunity. Our next stop is Po Town, which is overrun by Team Skull members. And I generally don't approve of Team Skull, but these two hustlers charging for the Pokemon Center, they're onto something. Gotta respect it. And those Spindas are just vibing. We fight our way through Potown, and then we end up in this abandoned mansion, which has been overrun by Team Skull, and ultimately at the end of it, we confront Guzma. So we have to have another battle. To start the battle off, we lead with Oracorio, and we immediately use our Fly MZ move, which will hit his Galissapod super effectively. And it's more than enough to take it out in one hit. Guzma has added a Pinsir to his team, which is the next Pokemon he brings in. So we hit it with an Air Slash, which should be super effective. It doesn't quite kill, but we get a flinch, so we're able to finish it off the next turn with a Relevation Dance. This just leaves his last Pokemon, Masquerain. Unfortunately, it outspeeds us and hits us with an Air Slash, which makes us flinch. So we have to swap in Charizard and hope that we don't take too much damage from the Air Slash. It does a pretty good amount, but not quite too much to make us switch to another Pokemon. 
so we're able to stay in and tank another air slash and then get some good damage with flame burst. We don't quite kill, so we have to swap to Arcanine, but he's able to finish the job with an extreme speed. I guess nobody ever told you that crime doesn't pay, Guzma. Almost immediately after this, we're able to fight the Island Kahuna, which is pretty refreshing in a game that loves to just draw things out. The Kahuna Nanu specializes in dark types, but his Sableye and his Persian both carry Power Gym, which is a rock move that'll hit us super effectively. And his Krokorok is part ground type and has Earthquake, which is a super dangerous move. So our plan for the Sableye and the Persian is to have a fighting type in that resists the rock move, and when the Krokorok comes in, switch to Charizard or to Oracorio, who are totally immune to Earthquake. The first turn, the Sableye fakes us out, which makes us flinch and unable to use a move, but the second turn, we use our Fire Z move to take this thing out real quick. Next, he brings in his Krokorok, who uses Earthquake, so we swap to Charizard, and we effectively get a free swap. The next turn, it uses Swagger on us, which is really annoying because we're confused, but we manage to hit a Flame Burst through the confusion. It doesn't quite kill, but we want to set up for the Persian who has Power Gym, which hits Charizard four times effectively, so we swap in Arcanine, who takes out the Krokorok with an extreme speed. Finally, he brings in his Ace Persian, and I realize I definitely should have a Fighting type out, so I bring in Infernape. It hits us with a Power Gym, which doesn't do too much damage, and then we hit it with a Close Combat, which we definitely thought would kill, but it doesn't, and that leaves us with a lowered defense. So we end up bringing in Blaziken. Unfortunately, on the turn we switched, he actually ended up using a full restore, which we should have anticipated and stayed in and used close combat, but live and learn. We managed to land a blaze kick on it, but we take too much damage from power gem, so we have to swap back to Infernape, who is able to live through two power gems and then ultimately take out the Persian with a close combat. That was certainly harder than it needed to be. After the battle, Nanu just starts flailing around, and Gladion just cannot believe what he's seeing. Then he just walks off all nonchalantly like that was a normal thing to do. I think I like that guy. Next up, we go back to the Aether Paradise, and this time, we're breaking in. We fight through the security, and then we're presented with one of the toughest battles of the run, which is against Lusamine. The main reason this battle is so tough is because she has a Melodic that's maxed out in defense and knows Hydro Pump, which will decimate any member of our team. So our plan was to bring in Torkoal to set up Sun, while holding a Hot Rock, which will make it last 8 turns instead of 5. And during these 8 turns, we'll be able to set up max special defense with Amnesia. And that should make us able to live through a Hydro Pump from the Melodic, so we can at least stall out some of its PP. We are able to get 2 Amnesias off, which does increase our special defense a lot, but we hit the Clefable with a Flame Burst, and we do not do nearly enough damage to take it out before the sun runs out. But through some divine intervention, for some reason, the next turn, Lusamine switches into her Melodic. Unfortunately, we've taken too much damage on Torkoal to really stay in against the Hydro Pump, even with our boosted special defense. So we use a Protect to waste one Hydro Pump before switching. And we bring in Infernape. And Infernape is able to live through one Hydro Pump with the sun. So the next turn, we are able to take out the Melodic with a Thunder Punch Z move. From here, she brings her Clefable back in, but we're able to swap into Arcanine and take it out with a couple Fire Fangs, followed by an Extreme Speed. Next up is her Beware, which hits pretty freaking hard. We stall one turn with Protect to get a little heal from the leftovers, and then we tank a takedown. We get too low, so we bring in Charizard, who finishes it off with a Flamethrower, which hits super effectively because of its Fuzzy Coat ability. Next, she sends in her Low Punny, who has both Thunder Punch and Ice Punch, which will hit Charizard pretty hard. So we're only able to get one turn of Flamethrower off on it, but we get some good damage and we're able to bring in Incineroar and then finish it off. Oh, and we do get a clutch little burn from the Fire Punch, which was pretty awesome. Finally, she's just down to her Lilligant, who does manage to paralyze us and confuse us, but it doesn't really stand a chance against our team, and it goes down to a couple Fire Punches. Remember earlier when I said Taurus was my second favorite thing in this game? Well, let me introduce you to my absolute favorite thing in this game. Man, I wish I really had someone like Machamp to carry me around at all times like this. I hope whoever's idea this was got a huge raise. Anyway, we're now on Pony Island, which is the last island of the game. And one of the first things we're able to do is grab a Delphox. This thing is awesome. Not only does it have a Psychic Dual type, which will be great for hitting fighting types and all sorts of other things super effectively, but it also has high special defense, which is something our team has been severely lacking. And since we have Machamp now, we're able to go back to the Lush Jungle and catch a Salandit. And gender evolutions are dumb, so we didn't catch any of the male Salandits, and we waited until we got a female so we could actually evolve it. Life is way too short to be catching male Salandits. Next, we battle through a few trainers and then grab the Focus Sash. This will be huge for the Ultra Necrozma fight, which is coming up. And on the same route, we're able to grab a Dust Stone, which allows us to evolve our Lampet into a Chandelure. Next, we head over to Executor Island, and these boys are just vibing. 
You ever go somewhere and you're just like, man, why don't I live here? Anyway, we help them with their pincer problem and then we head over to the next challenge. But first we have to do this gauntlet of ace trainers. And this is where the run really starts to go off the rails for me. This guy did have a Lapras, but we're able to take him out no problem. It's this next lady and her whale lord where things get really hairy. We have our Arcanine in and it does no wild charge, so we use our electric Z move. So no way it lives through this, right? Well, it does. And it takes out our Arcanine with a liquidation. Rest in peace, hot dog. Okay, cool. We lost a Pokemon, not a big deal. This next guy shouldn't be a problem, right? Well, as it turns out, this Flygon is an absolute menace. This thing almost wipes us and it takes out our Torkoal with an earthquake. We do manage to save everybody else, but we barely make it out of this fight alive. No, sir, I will not shake your hand. Rest in peace, Fire Turtle. At this point, I'm pretty tilted and that's a problem going into this totem fight. This thing is super strong. Not only is Kamoo the pseudo legendary for this generation, but it also has an Omni Boost, which is plus one to every single one of its stats. We lead with Delphox, and we're hoping that we can take this thing out with a Psychic Z move on the first turn, which we're almost able to, but unfortunately it barely lives, and it calls in its allied Pokemon Scyther. And this Scyther has Pursuit, which hits Delphox super effectively and will definitely kill it from here. So we're forced to use a Flamethrower on it instead of taking out the Kamo'o. It does go down, but he immediately calls in another ally, this Noivern. Unfortunately, Delphox is too low to stay in, so we have to bring in our Marowak. Which unfortunately goes down to a Dragon Pulse from Noivern and a Dragon Claw from Kamo'o. Rest in peace. We're in trouble. We bring in our Infernape the next turn, and he goes down to a Dragon Claw and an Air Slash. Oh god. We've now lost four Pokemon in the last three battles. Next we swap in Charizard, but it takes way too much damage for me to be comfortable with keeping it in for another turn. We stall with Protect, and then we bring in Chandelier. And we get a clutch Flame Body proc on the Kamo'o's Thunder Punch, which actually ends up taking it out, which is super lucky. Without that burn, I am almost 100% sure we would have wiped here. But this Noivern is still a huge problem. Fortunately, our Oracorio is still at full health, so we're able to bring it in and we're able to stall with Roost while we set up Calm Minds to be able to tank its super powerful special moves with increased special defense. And in a few turns, we get to a point where we're comfortable enough to take it out with an Air Slash. If you thought that fight was crazy, <laughs> you just wait till you see the rest of this run. Unfortunately, our island challenge is interrupted by a bunch of aliens like this lollipop thing and Necrozma and this lion thing and Ultra Necrozma and all this crazy story stuff, but we don't really care about it. So let me just show you the Ultra Necrozma fight. This fight is known as a run killer in this game for a very good reason. Not only does Ultra Necrozma have one of the highest base stat totals that I've ever seen at 754, for reference, normal Pokemon are on average around 500-ish, but it also has an Omni Boost and it's level 60 when you fight it, and the level cap is 54. This is a crazy fight. Luckily, we did get a Salazzle, who knows Toxic, and we have the Focus Sash. So I think you can see where this is going. On the first turn, we tank the Photon Geyser, and then set up Toxic. From here, we protect for one turn, and then we swap an Incineroar, who is immune to psychic moves. So the Photon Geyser doesn't affect him. The next turn, we protect with Incineroar, but it's not quite enough to take it out. And we know we're gonna have to sacrifice a Pokemon to this thing. So we make the hard decision and decide Incineroar must be chopped. You served us well, boy. From here, we just protect one more time and then the Toxic takes it out. I legit don't know how you would beat this without Toxic stalling. After this, there's just one more trial before we take on the last Kahuna. This trial is pretty cool because it has us going around and fighting all the trial captains to collect these petals to take on the actual totem Pokemon. These trial captain fights are pretty uneventful, um, except for one, and it's probably not the one you would expect. No, it is not the normal trial. Nope, not the grass trial either. Yes, it is in fact the fire trial. We get ourselves into a sticky situation and we need to get a flinch on this rock slide, but we don't get it and then we lose our Blaziken to a Shadow Bone. Losing both Infernape and Blaziken, who are our two fire fighting types, means that the Rock Elite 4 member is gonna be so insanely hard. I was playing really bad on this stream, I will be honest. Anyway, we get the last pedal from Nanu, who just apathetically hands it over without a battle. Told you I like this guy. And finally, it's time to take on the last totem, which is Ribambi a fairy bug type Pokemon, which is really a great matchup for us, which we definitely needed after our last string of battles. 
Though this thing does have plus two to all its stats, which makes it not super easy. We leave with Charizard and trade a Fire Z move for a Dazzling Gleam. We take a little bit of damage, but we do about half of the health of the Ribbon B2. Ribbon B then calls in its ally, a Blissey. Offensively, this Blissey is not really that concerning, but it does have some heals and some other annoying stuff, so we can't really discount it. The next turn, we take a Dazzling Gleam, which takes us pretty low, and we almost finish it off with a Flamethrower, but it doesn't quite take the Ribbon B out, so we have to take out our Charizard and swap in our Salazzle. And from here, we just Toxic stall this thing down. I'll spare you the details. Then we swap in our Oracorio to stall out the Blissey's last turns. And that's it, that's all the totems, woo! Now it's just the last Kahuna and then the Elite Four. And boy, do we have a battle with Hapu, the last Kahuna. Hapu specializes in ground types who hit our team super effectively and are very strong. Hapu leads with Golurk, who can set up Stealth Rocks, which would do big damage to our team every time we swap someone in. So we take it out on the first turn with a Grassium Z move. All right, so far so good. Next, she sends in Gastrodon, who's a water ground type. So we set up Sun to try to hit it with a solar beam and also weaken its water moves. It hits us with a muddy water, but it doesn't do too much damage so we can stay in and take this thing out with a solar beam. Next up is her Flygon and spoiler alert, this thing is another menace. On its first turn in, it uses a Dragon Breath, which instantly paralyzes us. That's super unlucky but at least we do manage to get a solar beam off on it and get some good damage. Charizard is too low to stay in at this point, so we have to bring in our Delphox, which of course instantly gets paralyzed by Dragon Breath. There's no chance of us outspeeding with Paralysis, so we have to bring in Oricorio because we know this thing is gonna use Earthquake, which Oricorio is immune to. The next turn, it hits us with a critical Dragon Breath. Come on, man. At least we live to get an Air Slash off, but it just barely doesn't kill. We ran damage calculations for this fight and this was an extreme low roll on damage here. The next turn, Hapu heals up with a Hyper Potion, and we go for a Roost out of fear. We probably should have Air Slashed here, but hindsight's 2020. Next turn, it hits us with a Dragon Breath, which, you guessed it, paralyzes us. At least we're able to get some good damage with Air Slash. We go for the kill on the next turn, but we get fully paralyzed, and we take too much damage from Dragon Breath, so we have to switch out the Oracorio. And we bring in Chandelure, who tanks a Dragon Breath, but we know he's gonna die to an Earthquake. So at this point, our only choice is to just swap around and stall out the PP of Earthquake. We make something like 20 switches, and at a certain point, we get so low that we have to sacrifice Oracorio, which really hurts. We get to the point where we actually have to start swapping Turtonator into Dragon Breaths, which is just so dangerous. And at this point, it feels like I've lost this fight. We have one final move we can make, which is to swap Charizard in, install the last PP of Dragon Breath, and he clutches it out and lives with seven HP. We are not even close to out of the woods yet, but since the Flygon is out of PP, Hapu brings in her ace Mudsdale, which we haven't even touched with damage yet. Luckily, we read the switch and we're able to bring in our Salazzle on the same turn she brings in her Mudsdale, which we use to bait out the Z move on Earthquake and we immediately swap back to Charizard, who's immune to the Earthquake Z. At this point, we have another round of Earthquake PP to stall out. So we bounce back and forth between Charizard and Turtonator while also using some Protects to stall it out. We just have to hope this Turtonator has enough HP to live through these switches. At a certain point, I think I thought that the Mudsdale was out of Earthquake PP, but I definitely miscounted, and so we lose Chandelure. Better than risking Charizard to a payback, but still, wow, what a misplay. But we know it's actually out of Earthquake PP now. All we need to do is just survive one heavy slam, which we just barely do with seven HP. Thank God for no crits through shell armor. Not quite out of the woods yet. We just need to live through this payback. Nice. And now finally, we're at the point where we take less damage than we heal. And about 10 turns of stalling later, we're finally able to take this Mudsdale out with a flamethrower. You can see in my face cam how shocked I am to survive this fight. The Flygon comes back in and we finish it off with a flamethrower. Man, that was crazy. I really thought I was gonna have to reset there and I was so mad because this game takes so long to play. With all our casualties, we're down to just four Pokemon on our team. But thankfully, we're able to get two more encounters through Pokepelago. We pick up a Houndor, which we immediately evolve into a Houndoom and we pick up a Litleo, which we evolve into a Pyroar. These are two pretty strong additions to our team, and we have a pretty solid squad going into the Elite Four. Thankfully, I took a break after the last stream and just took a really long time to theorycraft out this Elite Four. Even with all the preparation, we still are very susceptible to losing to the Rock Trainer, but thankfully in this game, you can choose the order that you challenge the trainers. 
So we start off with the Steel Trainer Morlane, who should be pretty straightforward because we hit every single member of his team super effectively. He leads with a Klefki who has Prankster, so it has priority on its Thunder Wave, which paralyzes us, but we did prepare for this with a Cherry Berry, and we take this thing out with one Flamethrower. Next he sends in his Metagross, who we know is going to use its Fighting Type move Hammer Arm to hit our Pyro super effectively, so we swap in Charizard. And before the fight, we had given Charizard choice specs, so we hit it with a boosted Flamethrower and take it out in one hit. Next up is his Magnezone, who knows Thunderbolt, so we swap out Charizard for Delphox. It goes for a Screech, which it misses, and then it goes for another Screech on the next turn, which it hits. But we do manage to get some good damage off on it with Psychic. From here, he withdraws his Magnezone and brings out his Doug Trio. Look at the locks on that thing. We hit it with a Psychic, which gets a little bit of damage on it, but we know it's going to hit us with an Earthquake on the next turn, so we have to bring in Charizard. He uses Earthquake, which we're immune to, and then we take it out with a Flamethrower on the next turn. Next, he brings his Magnezone back in, and since it took a little bit of chip damage, we can take this thing out with a Flamethrower. Finally, his Bisharp comes in, and it goes down to a Flamethrower as well. One down, three to go. Next, we go for the Ghost-type trainer, Acerola, and she has her own version of the Spooky Dance. Spooky! We go for this trainer because we have Houndoom, who resists all Ghost-type moves with his Dark-type, and also was able to learn the Ghost-type move Shadow Ball, which hits the whole team super effectively. So our plan is to set up two nasty plots with Houndoom and then sweep with Shadow Ball. We manage to get both nasty plots off and then start the sweep. We take out the Banette with the Shadow Ball, then the Palisan comes in and we take it out with the Shadow Ball as well. Next up is the Delmize, who we use Flamethrower for. Then Frostlass comes in, who's the only Pokemon who outspeeds us. It actually hits us with a Blizzard and freezes our Houndoom. My God, man, my luck. And we learn that only fire moves that make contact actually thaw you out of freezing, not Flamethrower, so good to know. Luckily, this isn't too big of a deal. We just swap in Pyroar and finish off the Frostlass with a Flamethrower. And her last Pokemon is Driplim, who only has a Ghost move for an attacking move, which can't actually damage Pyroar because it's normal fire type. So we just chip away at it with Flamethrower and eventually take it out. Two down, two really hard ones to go. Next, we up to take on the Golfer Extraordinaire and Flying type trainer, Kahili. She has two really scary Pokemon. Her lead, Braviary, has Brave Bird, which is an 120 power move and max out attack. This thing smacks. And her Ace 2 Cannon has Rock Blast and the ability Skill Link, which makes it so it hits five times every time. That destroys anyone on our team. Nobody survives that. So our plan is to use Will-O-Wisp to burn the Braviary on the first turn, cutting its attack in half. Unfortunately, our Will-O-Wisp misses and the Braviary uses Scary Face, which means that we don't have speed control anymore. But fortunately, that means we didn't take any damage that turn. The next turn, we do have to tank a Brave Bird, but we do actually land the Will-O-Wisp this time. So we're safe to swap around our team and stall out the Brave Bird PP. First, we bring in Houndoom, then we swap to Charizard who tanks a Scary Face, and then we bring in Pyroar. A Pyroar knows the move Noble Roar, which actually decreases attack and special attack. So we start using that to decrease the special attack and the attack on this thing so that we can swap in someone to start setting up to be able to take out the two cannon in one hit when it comes in. Now, Kahili does use a full restore here, so we go for another Will-O-Wisp to burn this thing again. With two Noble Roars and one burn, we feel comfortable enough to bring in Turtonator and start Shell Smashing. So now we do have to get off three Shell Smashes to outspeed the Halucha and properly sweep her team, which we do manage to safely get. So the next turn, we take out the Braviary with a Flamethrower. Now we're plus six on attack, special attack, and speed. So we should be able to sweep the team, right? Wrong. Somehow this Mandipuzz lives a plus six Flamethrower and hits us with punishment, which we barely live. We do finish this thing off with a Flamethrower, but we're a little bit nervous as the Halucha comes in. I run the numbers and decide it's not safe to keep the Turtonator in, so I bring in Charizard. And of course, on the first turn in, it gets poisoned by Poison Jab. Go for a workup because we do still need to be plus on special attack to take out the two cannon and not get hit by Rock Blast. After thinking through it, we decide that plan's probably not going to work, so we swap in Salazzle to start setting up Nasty Plot instead. We get one Nasty Plot off, which is more than enough to take out the Holucha and should be enough to take out the two cannon as well. Now there was a small chance this didn't work, but the flamethrower does manage to take out the two cannon. Now there's just the Oricorio left. And at this point, Salazzle has really done her job. So we go for a Venishock, which doesn't kill, but it does enough damage to the Oricorio that we can actually finish it off after we sack the Salazzle. Rest in peace, friend. The next turn, we bring Charizard back in and finish this thing off with a flamethrower. Three down, 
one really tough one to go. Okay, so Olivia's whole team is extremely scary, but luckily she leads with an Armaldo, who is actually one of her weaker mons, and it's a physical attacker, so we can set up with Turtonator if we do manage to decrease its attack just a little bit. It could almost be a clean sweep, except her Probopass does have Sturdy, so we are gonna have to do something about that, and unfortunately, it's a special attacker, so we can't keep Turtonator in because it'll be minus three on special defense. Our plan is to swap the Delphox when that comes in to get some chip damage on it. The battle starts and the Armaldo comes out and we lead with Pyroar. We miss our first Will-O-Wisp, of course. No way we missed two in a row, right? Wrong, we missed two Will-O-Wisps in a row. It's 85% accurate, that's so unlucky. Third time's a charm and we finally get a burn on this thing. Unfortunately, we're minus defense, so we can't stand too much longer but we do manage to get a Noble Roar off before going, and we actually caught a break by the Armaldo missing its last Rock Blast. We take a Rock Blast, and then we switch to Turtonator. We take a Rock Blast as we switch in, but we're able to set up one round of Iron Defense, which should be more than enough to get us through to allow us to heal up and set up Shell Smash. From here, we max out our defense, then go plus six with Shell Smash, and then we take this thing out with a flash cannon. Next, she sends in her Gigalith, who does have Sandstream, which immediately sets up a Sandstorm. Rock types do get 1.5 times their special defense in a sandstorm, so we need to stall this thing out because the Cradilly is already borderline not gonna die to this flash cannon, even though we're plus six. Luckily, this thing is a physical attacker, so we can just protect stall until the sandstorm goes away. Once the sandstorm goes down, we take it out with flash cannon. Next, she sends in Lycanroc, who we actually outspeed and take out with a flash cannon. Next, she sends in Probopass, so we protect to scout out its next move. It actually uses Thunder Wave, so we know we can actually get a free turn of Flash Cannon before we switch out. So we hit it with a Flash Cannon, which does a laughable amount of damage, and somehow he misses the Thunder Wave. That means we don't even have to switch. We protect to scout it again just to make sure it's gonna Thunder Wave again, and it does. Next turn, we use another Flash Cannon and hope for a high roll to take this thing out. We get the high roll. Yes! And finally, she sends in Cradilly, who goes down to a Flash Cannon. Hardest fight in the game, done. Now there's just one fight left. And the professor gets me so good right here. Just one person you have to battle. Wait, what? Do we actually have to fight him? Yeah, I know, I fell for it. But the person we actually have to fight is Hal. And our plan for this fight is pretty simple. We're gonna set up Calm Minds on Delphox and then sweep his team. We alternate using Wish, Calm Mind, and Protect, and we end up with plus six on special attack and special defense, which is more than enough for us to take out this Raichu with the Psychic. Next up is Vaporeon, who despite being a really big special tank, goes down to a Psychic as well. Then the Tauros comes in, which is the only Pokemon we were actually worried about because it does outspeed Delphox and can do big damage, especially because it has Earthquake. But we run the numbers and realize we can actually live through an Earthquake, which we do, and then we take it out with a Psychic. Next, he sends in Crabominable, and it goes down to a Psychic. Next up is Noivern, which is a special attacker, and we're plus six on special defense, so we decide to go for a Hail Mary Wish in case we live the Dark Pulse, which we do. So we're able to protect and heal up, and because we're greedy, we go for another Wish and heal all the way up, and then we take it out with a Psychic. Finally, it's just as Decidueye, and we take it out with a Psychic, and that's that. Final battle in the books. We are now Alola's first ever champion. Wow, that was my most ridiculous run yet. If you made it this far in the video and you're not subscribed, come on. Also, if you don't mind, throw the video a like. It helps me out. Thanks. This was crazy. I'm tired. Thanks for watching. Till next time.